You rad. Um, actually, uh, do we know what he's speaking on yet? Just neuroscience in general. Neuroscience. He's going to get us more specific subjects soon. Because I know that he read, like, he wrote another book. It's not really neuroscience related. It's a little different, but anyway. He'd been out of town and said right, after he yeah. got back, he'd give us a. I'm really specific. excited for it. Um, Kelly Byers is going to sing actually the week before that. Um, and uh, the week after that, we have David Buchanan coming to speak on Marcus Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism, which would be pretty rad. Um, and uh, we actually have um, a couple cool, cool musical guests over the next few weeks. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember Brandon Ralphs. Uh, he came and he played the guitar and he sang kind of a bluegrass country song. And uh, it was really good. Uh, one of these days, we're going to have just like a full gathering of just music. I think that would be pretty awesome. Um, Kelly Byers and Cheryl Lavu are going to come um, sing here soon, sometime, sometime as well. And then Kelly, Kelly Byers is going to come speak on veganism here uh, in a couple months. That would be pretty awesome. Um, just kind of practical and understanding how to do that. So that would be pretty awesome. Um, any other announcements uh, from the group in general? We have uh, trying to be better about about doing things in the in the financially responsible way, and that means passing around a basket for everyone to put money in. So um, we are going to do that, though. Appreciate contributions um, helping us out. Um, allows us to do some fun events, fun activities, um, get decent equipment so that the gatherings are awesome. Um, so I'll pass this around. Also, we've had uh, some a, a number of people uh, marked down that they're interested in, in volunteering for things. We don't have the papers to pass around today, but uh, we would love to have any of your ideas uh, or you know any of your participation uh, in the group. Um, it's awesome when we get that. So I'm just going to set this right here and I'll let, let John start passing that around. Um, if there's nothing else, uh, we have um, a pretty exciting musical speaker. She, uh, sh she's a recording artist um, in some ways. She, uh, I, I don't quite know what to what to what extent uh, you you, you um, report. You'll introduce. <laughs> yeah, okay. I can, I can. I'm just getting in the way now, so I'm gonna let her yeah, introduce herself. Go on. Uh, let's Thank let's bring up Nairi. Shows. I've performed at like uh, Sarah Idol and just done local stuff mostly. Um, I do, uh, I guess, the thing I do for pay is I record fitness recordings. So I like, I basically go into a studio and I have to sound like the artist. And it's kind of fun because uh, these guys in Italy like remix it and like put it on the CD and sell it to schools that want to work out. So it's, it's really fun. I've, I've really enjoyed it. So. But, um, yeah, so then I'll sing at karaoke mostly, so. Yeah! All right. Yeah. So, um, today, the, this song, it, I wasn't expecting to choose this song, but it just, like, when I was listening to it, it kind of, like, really spoke to me. Um, it's an Evanescence song called Good Enough. I don't know if any of you, yeah. any of you fans. So, um, I really like the words to this. They, I, I feel like they personally mean something to me because I'm really, I've been into, I actually started writing again. So I like the songs about empowerment and freedom and like just finding your own voice. So, um, and just standing in your power. So this is that song. We're going to set it up. Hold on. The intro is like super long. So. Oh. Thank <laughs> you. 
Again, though. That's oh, I'll, I'll step past it. <laughs> it's good for the mood. Exactly. Yeah. I wish I was a better joke teller up here. <laughs> This Oasis Gathering brought to you by...
That's right. <laughs> All right, he is a, uh, he's a writer. He's published a book. He's been featured on the Salt Lake Tribune um, recently. He uh, is a content management specialist, from what I understand, if that's sort of close. I'll let him do more introduction of himself, but let's bring up John Ogden. <laughs> So, as Lance said, my name is John Ogden. I don't think there's any need for more introduction. Uh, so I'll just kind of leap right into this. So I wanted to talk today about philosophy, and philosophy can sometimes seem like it's all cerebral, and uh, it's all in the ivory tower, and it doesn't have anything to do with how we live. Um, and this talk will hopefully uh, counteract that idea that uh, philosophy is something that is very pragmatic, and something that really has to do with how we live day to day. So I'd like to start out by just talking about this concept of living a quality life. And one way that I like to talk about it is to start with a story from this guy named Ted Leonsis. And uh, Ted Leonsis isn't a philosopher, he's a business tycoon. And in his early 20s, he became a millionaire. And he, he was ecstatic. Uh, he <laughs> spent money on things that he thought would have made him happy, he bought multiple houses, multiple cars, and he was kind of living what he saw as the good life. And then one day he got into a plane, and the plane had problems mid-flight. And um, the pilot got on the intercom and said, we're going to have to do an, an emergency landing. And the people on the plane started getting very nervous, and people were crying, and some were shouting. And he kind of went inside himself and he said, oh my word, what am I, what am I going to do? Um, and he said that he decided that he had no alternative but to pray at the time, and he said that he turned to what he called his higher calling, and he said, if I make it through this, I'm going to give more than I take with my life, and I'm going to leave the world better than I found it. And so the pilot ended up succeeding in landing the plane, and he survived, but it really, it really shook him up. And the next weekend, he decided that he was going to sit down and he was going to write a list of 101 things that he wanted to do before he died. And they were focused a little bit more outwardly than he had been living to that time. Like, I'm going to take care of my mother and father. Um, I'm going to take care of my kids and you know, <coughs> they're provided for. I'm going to donate more to other people, etc. Basically, he asked himself this question right here. If I had to write my obituary, how would I keep score? And well, I said, as, as I started, that he's not a philosopher. That is a philosophical question, uh, where you kind of step back from the day to day and you think like, OK, so what is a quality life? Uh, how, how should we go about living it? Now, this story is old, right? Or this story uh, has been told many times, even with somebody like Ebenezer Scrooge. You see the same archetype, where somebody is living only for themselves. And then in the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, he sees his own funeral through uh, the ghost of Christmas yet to come, I think it's the formal title, and uh, the, he sees that nobody cares that he's dead. And they're trying to decide what to do with his stuff, and they're not talking about him at all, um, other than to make fun of him. And so when he wakes up from this visitation, he realizes that he needs to live for more than himself. And so again, this is the question, how to live? How do we live a quality life? Um, and in the early rise of civilization, there was, it was kind of straightforward, um, or you didn't, I don't know exactly how to put it, but the context was that uh, people, as, as the rise of 
civilization, people said, okay, we're going to trust in whatever the king says or whatever the pharaoh says. Um, there might be an oracle, but basically it's like, here's somebody who is the conduit of divinity, and that's how we know how to live. Whatever, whatever this person says, you know, we're going to get in line. Or at times uh, they would rebel and get slaughtered for rebellion. So it was the, the powerful few kind of dictated to the weak many how to live. Um, but that started to shift. Oh, sorry. Basically we had a tiny group of people who were dictating how everyone else should live. And this was the common theme in civilization. And the, the upside of this is that it did create like large scale communities. But did, it didn't allow for people to really uh, come to their own conclusions. You kind of had to get in line or die. Um, but around 600 BC, something started to shift in ancient Greece. Uh, democracy started to appear, and most famously in Athens. Um, this is what I have to see. But basically, this is the Acropolis where people uh, were gathered to uh, debate freely, and it was kind of the rise of democracy. And with the rise of democracy, people were able to reason for themselves, and they were able to say, like, I actually think that the way to live a quality of life is X, and I actually think it's Y. And so, what it, op it opened up the space for somebody to say, you know what? Whereas before it was like somebody said, I'm I'm the voice of divinity, therefore trust what I have to say. Now it's like, oh, you actually have to make the best argument to win, and this is. An amazing shift. So one, this is, and this is where philosophy was, Western philosophy at least was really born. And one famous uh, philosopher, Socrates, um, looked at how how to live. And he was at he. There's a story of him of an oracle at the time saying that an oracle was asked who was the wisest person, and she said it was Socrates. And Socrates kind of scoffed at that at first and said, I'm not wise. And then as, as he started thinking about it, he, this is the story at least, he said, um, actually, I, I'm going to test if that's true because I don't know anything. And I'm going to go around and see how people who think they know everything live. And as he questioned them, he realized that he was, he was indeed the wisest because he knew that he wasn't very wise. And so he started asking hard questions. And this is largely the, the bedrock of Western philosophy. He said such things as an unexamined life is not worth living. And he said, beware the barrenness of a busy life. Um, and he said, true wisdom comes to each of us when we realize how little we understand about life, ourselves, and the world around us. So this embodies a spirit of like humility Starting from a place that, okay, maybe I don't know what the answer is. And it's a, a powerful way to live because rather than just assuming that you know the, the will of a divine being, um, you kind of have to be introspective and really think about um, these questions more fully. You have to question your assumptions. And he questioned so much, he questioned so many of, the, of his fellow citizens that they eventually got tired and irritated at him, and they forced him to drink hemlock. Um, well, they voted for him to drink hemlock, and he had the chance to escape, but he decided that it, it was more noble to drink the hemlock, um, and he, he died from the poison. And so, but his questioning spirit lived on, and I'll just touch on three philosophers. Um, when I initially prepared this, prepared this talk, I was planning to just go through many, 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 but it got to be overbearing. So we'll just kind of focus on three philosophers from about this time, and then we'll break into the discussion and talk about philosophy. But the basic idea here is that this represents something of a split, whereas, again, it's not necessarily I know the truth because somebody who is the conduit of divinity says it's true, but I know this is true because of it uh, is logical and it's through reason. I mean, it's right here. Reality is known through reason, as one of the Oasis uh, principles says. So the first philosopher that I want to bring up is Aristotle. And Aristotle said, speaking of the meaning of life or how to live a quality of life, he said that happiness is the meaning and the purpose of life the whole aim and end of human existence. 
But then, so somebody seeing that might think like, okay, so I should just, you know, have fun and kind of party it up. But he undercuts that idea. He says the happy life is regarded as a life in conformity with virtue. It is a life which involves effort and is not spent in amusement. And certainly, I don't know how far he takes that. Never, I don't think. I don't, who knows? But he, might, he probably would say never have fun. Um, but he's saying that. Uh, the quality of life is actually hard to achieve, and you, you have to learn how to be virtuous. It doesn't come easy. So he created this idea of the golden mean, which is still incredibly powerful today, where he says that virtue is actually the balance of various um, characteristics. So in this first one, you can see he says that virtue is courage. Courage is a virtue. But you can go wrong by having too little courage, and you can go wrong by having too much courage. Too little courage is cowardice. Too much courage is rashness. Um, other ones, generosity. If you have too little generosity, it's stinginess. If you have too much generosity, it's extravagance. Um, good humor. Too little of that is moroseness, and too much of that is absurdity. So. Friendship, uh, too little is quarrelsomeness. You're always bickering, always fighting. But too much of that is flattery, where you're just a sick man, where you're just constantly uh, trying to get in good with people, and it's very insincere. This is still very useful today, I would say, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's so easy to go wrong in trying to live the virtuous life, which he would say is the happy life. Uh, we can say, just, just be good. But in practice, it becomes much harder. It's, it's easy to see, oh, man, I'm slipping out a little bit on, um, when it comes to, say, self-control. I have too much indecisiveness. I need to, to get that in line. So this is a very useful concept in learning how to live a quality life. We can look at other things that he said, he said, excellence is never an accident. It is always the result of high intention, sincere effort, and intelligent execution. It represents the wise choice of many alternatives. Choice, not chance, determines your destiny. And then he said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. So this is, um, again, still incredibly useful to us. What are your habits that you're building that are leading you to the life that you're living? And are they? It's worth reflecting on, as Aristotle said, examining your life. Are these the habits that you really want to be developing? Or should you take a step back and think like, oh, actually I need to develop different habits because I'm not in line with the quality of life I want to live. In other words, go back to the question that Ted Leonce has asked, which is, if I were to write my obituary, how would I keep score? That single question is useful for stepping back and thinking like, am I, am I doing the things that I need to be doing to to really have a good eulogy, or to live the quality of life. Finally, Aristotle said, we are not studying in order to know what virtue is, but to become good, for otherwise there would be no profit in it. And this is, uh, to me, somewhat of a critique of the ivory tower, where academia can become very cerebral. Um, and he's saying, you know, we're not studying just to know things, we're studying to actually become good people. He says, all persons ought to endeavor to follow what is right and not what is established. And then finally, without friends, no one would want to live, even if he had all of the goods. And this concept of friendship carries into other philosophers. This is the second one that I'll talk about, Epicurus. He said, of all the things to ensure happiness throughout the whole, throughout the whole life, uh, so it must, it must be a typo, by far the most important is the acquisition of friends. So Epicurus, was a philosopher who lived after Aristotle, um, and he wanted to also seek the essence of a happy life. Now there's an interesting book called The Swerve, and in this book, a scholar talks about Epicurus, and he says that Epicurus dramatically influenced modern society, even though many people haven't heard of him. Uh, so he, the basic argument in this book, he, he says that Epicurus wrote lots and lots of books during his lifetime. But they were all so viewed as so controversial that they ended up getting destroyed. And um, he tells a story in this book, Swerve, 
where this Italian scholar in 1300 discovered a manuscript of somebody who had written about Epicurean ideas. And the scholar in 1300 was kind of wowed by it. Everybody, had, he had seen traces of people talking about Epicurus, and Lucretius was the guy who wrote this manuscript, and, but he hadn't ever been able, nobody had been able to find the actual writings. Um, and so he found this book that talked about Epicurean ideas, and the big thing about Epicurus is that he started from this idea that uh, you can explain the world without having to resort to talking about God and every time. So people at the time would say, oh, lightning is caused by Zeus, right? And they would, they would talk about these um, fantastic explanations for the way the world worked. And he, he was interested in explaining the world in a natural way. Like, no, you don't actually have to turn to God. And he was wildly off base in his assumptions because he didn't have the correct scientific instruments. But he was trying to say, that, trying to show how the world worked. So he said, for instance, that clouds are caused because it's two clouds, or sorry, lightning is caused because two clouds hit together and it squeezes out the lightning. Uh, so it's like really, really bad science, um, but at least the attempt is saying, we don't have to resort to saying it's a, it's a deity in every case. There are natural explanations. And from there, what he says is, so from that premise, then what is the purpose of life? It's not necessarily to please the gods. It's to, again, like Aristotle, find how to be happy. And so that's the foundation of his philosophy. And he said this that I, I think is a great principle in life. He says, there are times when we pass over many pleasures, whenever greater difficulty follows from them. Also, we regard many pains as better than pleasures, since a greater pleasure will attend us after we have endured pain for a long time. So, for instance, this might be like, you know what? Running a marathon is incredibly unpleasurable, right? Uh, and we don't want to do it. But some people might say, actually for me, I find that I get better pleasure deciding to do that, even though it's painful. So he says that, so that sometimes you want to avoid pleasure because it leads to greater pain, and sometimes you want to lean into pain because it leads to greater pleasure. And so this is a simple rule to decide how you want to live. Is this activity going to ultimately bring me better pleasure even though it's painful? For instance, studying really hard for the MCAT, or um, working, working long hours at your job because you know that if you do that, you'll result in greater pay, and that's what you're after. Sometimes we decide that we're going to lean into pain because it's going to lead to great rewards. And this is actually a lot of times why, I, this is a tangent, but this is a lot of times why I think that many religions are very useful because they, they set up commandments to actually follow this principle. It's not to say that all of them, all the commandments that a religion sets up are without flaw, but occasionally they hit this principle right on. Like, actually, you do want to follow these principles because they lead to greater pleasure. The key with Epicurus is that it's not saying you a divinity said that. It's saying use reason, again, to figure out which ones are really going to lead to greater pleasure. Which ones are? Which ones do you want to lean into because you know that they're worth following? Finally, he said, um, Actually, I have two more slides of him. So he says, do not spoil what you have by desiring what you have not. Remember that what you have now is once among the things you only hope for. Right? And so this is a great line for gratitude. Right? If you're thinking, man, my life is horrible. My life is horrible. But at one point, you were just yearning for the things that you have now. Um, so that's a good, that's a good thing to, to reflect on. And then he said, it is folly for a man to pray to the gods for what he, for that which he has the power to obtain by himself. And he said, if the gods listen to the prayers of men, all mankind would quickly perish, since they constantly pray for many evils to befall one another. <laughs> <laughs> so he believed that the gods existed, but he believed that the gods didn't care about us. Um, so he said, it's not, it's not useful to pray for it. You know, this is the 
the human hand solve human problems. That's a very Epicurean idea where it's like, okay, you know, you can play how you want, but when it comes down to it, you just you got you need to do it. Um, and he says, I love this so much. Empty is the argument of the philosopher which does not relieve any human suffering. So again, it's very pragmatic philosophy. Uh, it has it's not just cerebral thinking, cool uh, thoughts that you might think. Um, it's it's very pragmatic. So finally, let's talk about Seneca. Seneca is another philosopher at the time, and uh, he was a Stoic, which um, David's going to talk about in a future in future weeks. Um, but he said that true happiness is to enjoy the present, without anxious dependence upon the future, not to amuse ourselves with either hopes or fears, but to rest satisfied with what we have, which is sufficient. The greatest blessings of mankind are within us and within our reach. He said, there is no easy way from the earth to the stars. And that's, a, that's poetic, but I love the idea that, you know, we have these human beings have these grand notions and we just have to accept there's no easy way to get there but we can still strive you know we can still aim for the stars um, but we do have to acknowledge it's not simple it's not easy if any man knows not which port he sails nor no wind is favorable and associate with people who are likely to To conclude, I'll just talk about a couple of ideas here. So this French philosopher, Luc Ferry, uh, wrote this book called A Brief History of Thought. And in this book, he's, he talks about this idea of salvation. And he's trying to define some philosophy. And he, and he talks about religion and he talks about philosophy. And he says that religion and philosophy are both trying to bring salvation to human beings. And religion does it by talking about authority and faith, and says, you know, if you if you believe this authority, then you're going to be saved, and if you do what the authority says, you're going to be saved. And uh, philosophy does it by um, talking about uh, tools that you can use to live by, like these philosophers have given us, or that I've already shown. Now, it's not to say that uh, the religious are unreasonable. But it's just to say that if you're in a religion, that's what that's what they talk about is uh, revelation, right? Knowing things through revelation. Philosophy, on the other hand, says that you can. We're all and sorry, salvation is coming. We need salvation because we're afraid of our weakness. We're afraid of death. So it gives us a way to live so that we can cope with our fears. And that's the great strength of philosophy. That's what he's saying in this book. That the more that we study philosophy, the more we see, like, oh, okay, I can feel, I can feel at peace in my life, and I can feel this firm foundation that gives me the strength to live a quality life. Um, so again, both religion and philosophy are, are about the work of salvation, but they're doing it in different ways. And I, I kind of like that notion. Um, but take that over until you can. <laughs> um, so, and then finally, I wanted to talk about this idea of that this author Jennifer Michael Heck talked about in her book *Doubt and History*. So, one one advantage I think of religion is that there's a canon of text that ties people to their to the past, and so people read scripture and they see like how people used to think. And it tie, it's not just about the here and now, which can sometimes just get lost in busyness and day-to-day -day life and consumerism. What this author does in her book, Doubt and History, is she tries to recreate that idea that there is a canon, that, this, that these ideas have been around for a really long time, and that uh, secular people have a very rich tradition to pull from. So she shows how, how long this has been going on and how many there are. It's a, it's a pretty thick book uh, where she's showing person after person after person that are heroes of secular philosophy in, in a sense. And they are people that we can turn to and say, hey, actually, these problems that I'm trying to wrestle with right now in my life to figure out how to live a quality life, they've already been 
figure it out, a lot of them. We don't have to reinvent the wheel with every new line. A lot of times we can turn to Seneca or we can turn to Aristotle and say like, oh, they actually have uh, solutions that we can turn to. And I'll just close with this idea that all of us have a philosophy of life, whether we can articulate it or not. And um, at times we can just default to the standard philosophy of life, which in American culture often is just consumerism. If I just buy more things, then I'm going to live a quality life, right? If I just have more amusement, I'm going to have a quality life, which, and which um, often tends to bring anxiety. And we don't, we don't realize it. We, we see that technology is improving, but we're also seeing a lot of um, problems with mental illness, etc. And I think that a lot of the solutions, though not all, uh, can be found in philosophy and in looking at what wise people in the past have said and taking that into our lives and using that to live a more virtuous life. And that that can lead to a deeper tranquility and happiness than uh, what just the default uh, consumerist culture. So I'd like to break into discussion now, or maybe put question and answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The alliance. Did they all have extra beards? <laughs> <laughs> Hard to shave. <laughs> what personally started you, I don't know, to, to feel the connection or a need to study philosophy and how it um, I, so I studied English literature in college, and a lot of a lot of literature is kind of tied to philosophy, and so um, so I was doing that a lot in college, and then it just continued to be interesting, like that question of just mainly the question like how do you live a quality life? How do you live a life so that at the end you think, yeah, that was, I I really lived the life that I was I feel like I was meant to live not look back and regret. So one study that really helped me is, or one uh, article is by this nurse, this end of life nurse, where she worked with people who were like the last three weeks of life. And she asked them all like, what do you regret? What do you regret about your life? And she came up with the top five regrets of the day. And reading through those made me really think like, you know what, I, I want to not say this when I, when I die. Uh, so one was like, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. And by that they mean like, I wish I hadn't just gotten to the rat race. Oh my God. You know, like people working at their desk job, just to work at the desk job, day in, day in, day in, you know, over and over again. I wish I lived for something more. I wish I uh, kept closer to my friends, was another one. Uh, which you see in a lot of philosophers are saying, hey, friendship is, leads to a quality life. Don't get confused in thinking that if you just get more money, that's sufficient. That might be play a part, but that's not sufficient for a quality. And so it's kind of that that drive to say, you know, I don't want to just be on my deathbed and say, like, no, I just regret. I've heard that saying, no one ever dies saying I regret spending so much time with my family. Right. Yeah. Family. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's a little bit of the story. Right. Yeah, Holly. Where, where do you think people ever come up with the idea that philosophy is an ivory tower and not mm -hmm. practical? I, I don't get that at all. Um, that's a good question. So just, it has become institutionalized. A lot of contemporary philosophers are very hard to understand. Um, at least they're hard for a simple brain like mine to understand. They're like, I, I try to read them and they're just very cerebral and they feel like they don't have much to do with my daily life. Um, though, some, though there are definitely exceptions to that. And so once it became institutionalized, then people are like, you know, I, they, they want to, I, I, I don't know about this, but it seems to me that they want to feel like um, they've, they've worked really hard to get the job that they have. And so they want to feel like they have, that they know things that, or they can talk at a level that other people can't talk at. 
So they're trying to innovate too much, probably, beyond what's even needed for most human beings. Maybe. I think a lot of the questions they ask aren't very practical, too. It's a, it's a huge field, though, so it's hard to generalize, because there are a lot of things going on in the, in the field. I happen to be more, most interested in ethical questions, but there's like epistemology, like questions of how you know what is true, which I'm not as interested in. So there are a lot of different fields, and so it is hard to generalize. But um, a lot of philosophy can just be cerebral and not pragmatic. That's not for I, just, I, just, yeah, I, just, I don't see it that I, I mean, I wonder, I don't know, most people in this room don't feel that way, right? I, mean, I, don't know. I agree with you. Like, but I, I, I don't know what I would do without philosophy. I, I mean, it's, it's a constant with me. That's good. And I don't know, I mean, you almost have to, it seems like you almost have to, have to not have a brain, you know? <laughs> and don't use philosophy in your day-to-day -day life, you know? Uh, Kurt? Is yeah. Kurt? Yeah. So, I'm not going to be the one to ask you about sad more than Um <laughs> But, but, but um, I do have a question for you that I sort of suspect, based on the gist of your presentation, I have an inkling where the answer might be. But what do you think of, of the existentialists, the Nietzsche, Heidegger, Sartre, Camus, etc.? Right. So, <laughs> so I'm personally not a big fan, um, but again, I, I often find that the things that are held as classics at, in academia, such as Heidegger or uh, Nietzsche, um, I often find that when I dislike something that is held up as a classic in academia, it's, beca I, it's because I don't understand it <laughs> well enough. So I've tried many, many times to understand Heidegger and Nietzsche, and I've read multiple books from them, and they just don't do anything for me. Um, so it's probably because they don't understand it. But I just don't see a connection to my personal life. And, and except in the case of Nietzsche, I think that he is just, I, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't see him as, I don't see him as promoting uh, quality of life. Gotcha. Uh, so that's just my personal opinion. So, who are the modern day philosophers that sort of take more of the ancient Greek and Roman path to you know, how you should live your life, or sure. increase your happiness, etc.? Right. A lot of them are kind of scoffed at from the institutional academia, um, like Elaine de Vuitton. But I think he's phenomenal. Uh, who wrote a book called Religion for Atheists. He wrote a book that's terrific called Consolations of Philosophy, where he looks at six different philosophers um, and talks about how they can be made pragmatic. Um, Jonathan Haidt, he, who is applauded for his, and rightly so for his work in psychology, he's a psychologist, but in his book, The Happiness Hypothesis, he turns to ancient wisdom and says, like, here's how we can make these, these ideas pragmatic in life, and it's very easy and simple to understand. How did these Roman and Greek philosophers compare with Eastern philosophers? They come to a lot of the same conclusions. Like this idea of being grateful for what you have, uh, the good life being tied to virtue, is the good life is not being something that is necessarily amusing, something you have to work for. Yeah, they're very much in line on those points. So, and she actually talks about Buddhist philosophy in here. Jewish philosophy, um, Muslim philosophy, and so it's it's much bigger than just Western. Yeah. But a lot of times they come to very similar conclusions, which is interesting, even though they weren't in conversation with each other. So. I, I, I like uh, I like Sam Harris's take on it too, because he comes from a very philosophical angle, but he also comes from the meditative tradition as well. Sure. And, and has kind of made a really beautiful synthesis of the two. I think. Yeah. He's made it very practical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He doesn't count. He's just an angry atheist. <laughs> <laughs> he's like the least angry atheist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, John, would it be safe to say in your studies of all these different 
philosophers that pretty much all of them are atheists? No. The, so even here, she, so a lot of them, like even after Curtis, he wasn't, he wasn't an atheist in the way that we would say it because he believed the gods existed. He just thought that they didn't care about humans at all. So <laughs> atheist is kind of a tricky word because our modern understanding of the word is a little different than than other understandings. So for instance, like um, Spinoza uh, was a Jew and like, like he, he believed, uh, he, he talked about God, so by God he meant like a, almost like a force in nature that is part of everything. Like a wind or a rain or uh, a storm. What's that? It's more or less indifferent to human activity. Right, but it's something of the divine within everything, but it's not like a, a person, a god who's like a tangible being. So is he an atheist? And, and Albert Einstein said that he believed in the god of Spinoza. Well, at the time, everybody was calling, not everybody, well, everybody was calling Spinoza an atheist. So he believed in God. Magnetic fields or gravity or... Well, he was more talking about like... A scientific phenomenon than calling for God. Sure, some people might. So the word is a little tricky. But basically, this idea that philosophy is at its core, it, so there are, there are plenty of religious philosophers, but when they're doing philosophy, it's not saying, oh, I had a revelation from God. It's saying, I've come to these ideas through reason. So it's not that they're either or, but just the work of philosophy isn't tied to religion. So. Let's hear it for John Alderman. So just a couple really fast questions about this in general. So do you have a website or a blog or anything like that where you talk about this kind of stuff? Uh, I haven't talked about this specifically, mm -hmm. but it's, yeah, johnogden.com. johnogden.com. J-O-N. J-O-N. Like the city. Yep. Right? Okay. Uh, and do you have a Facebook page or just friend you on Facebook kind sure. of thing? Are you accepting friends right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and well, then, doesn't, that, doesn't that show the happiness of life? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, we're we're trying trying what we learned today. Uh, and so, if someone wanted to dip their toes into studying this kind of thing, where where do you think would be the best place to, to kind of start without diving into a really cerebral philosophy? Sure. So um, a lot of the ancient Greeks like um, Seneca or Marcus Aurelius, who David's going to talk about, uh, are an Epictetus, it's a hard word to say. Uh, they, they're very easy to understand the primary text. Like e even today, it's very easy to just read through it. Um, but a good intro is that book uh, by Elaine de Khan called Consolations of Philosophy. Consolations of Philosophy. Consolations. Con Consolations. Sorry. Consolations, like being. Not the stars. <laughs> uh, yeah. being, being consoled by philosophy. Uh, right. Consolations of Philosophy by Elaine de Khan, where he just introduces six philosophers and says, here's how their words apply to today. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an book club. <laughs> that actually sounds rad. Let's talk about that afterward. Uh, any others? Um, Dow is great if you're interested in a big overview. Mm -hmm. uh, the happiness hypothesis is fabulous. I just finished that this past week and it was amazing. Work by Jonathan Haidt, who also yeah. wrote The Righteous Mind. Okay. Uh, he's, he's terrific. And lastly, any good podcasts um, that you know of for us commuters? Good question. I I was listening to audiobooks, so okay. I don't have any knowledge about podcasts. Okay. Cool. So. Awesome. Kelly. There's a really good podcast called Ir Irreligious Song. Irreligious Song. I can never pronounce it, but there it is. <laughs> it's like philosophy and irreligious combined. And it talks about this type of stuff. Do you mean religious? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Cool. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and know this and put it on the Facebook page. And then like Sam Harris waking up with Sam Harris is what I'm listening to. Waking up? Waking Wednesday. up with Sam Harris. Oh, the podcast? It's the name of his podcast. Cool, cool. It's pretty good. Awesome. 
Uh, let's continue this afterward. We gotta go down and get kids. Um, but why? what's that? He said why. So <laughs> <laughs> the kids program people don't worry now. Uh, make sure I, I might be right here. <laughs> make sure and give give John Ogden a handshake or a hug or um, a visit to his website or a thumbs up or something like that because he's awesome and we appreciate appreciate John. Um, go buy what? Go buy his book. Go buy his book, yeah, of course. Uh, it's also on Amazon. Um, uh, what is your book called again? When Mormons Doubt. When Mormons Doubt. A way to save relationships and seek control of your life. Which I believe just hit number one on new religious book releases, or what, what was the specific Mormon. category? Uh, Mormon. Mormonism. Mormonism? New releases of Mormonism. New releases of Mormonism? Really? Okay, that's rad. Awesome. Uh, on Amazon Kindle, or just on Amazon right now? Uh, paper fashion. Cool, awesome. Uh, thanks everyone for coming, appreciate it. Uh, if you like what you saw today, we'd love to receive some of your, report, some of your support. Go to um, uboasis.org slash donate. That would be awesome and super helpful for us to get more speak, awesome speakers like John. Otherwise, if you have any questions, make sure and go to our Facebook community and uh, contribute your thoughts uh, and uh, we'd love to, to have you get involved, even if you're just like, this was awesome, or this sucked. That's also helpful for us, too, so we know it doesn't work. So, thanks for coming. Let's give one last round of applause for